And we have two awesome speakers that work in private practice. So they're going to give us some great information on running a scleral lens practice. First, we have Dr. Rob Ensley, who attended the Ohio State University for his undergraduate degree before completing his optometric education and his residency at UMSL College of Optometry. His residency was in cornea and contact lenses, and he is trained in specialty contacts, including scleral lenses, orthokeratology lenses, and multifocal lenses. Dr. Ensley served as the national liaison for the American Optometric Association cornea and contact lens section while he was a student at UMSL. Dr. Ensley currently specializes in fitting difficult to fit patients, including those with keratoconus or, or irregular corneas, corneal transplants, post RK or LASIK patients, and patients suffering from severe dry eye or ocular surface disease. Dr. Ensley is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Sclera Lens Education Society, as well as the current treasurer, or sorry, vice president. Um, he is also, the, also a member of the Kentucky Optometric Association and the American Optometric Association. Additionally, he has lectured on the topic of contact lenses to both students and doctors and authored several articles for review of cornea and contact lenses. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We also have Dr. Joshua Davidson, who grew up in Michigan and attended the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor for his undergraduate degree in biology. He then went on to complete his doctorate of optometry degree at the Michigan College of Optometry. Dr. Davidson's interests are in the areas of dry eye treatment, especially contact lenses and ocular surface disease. And he is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Sclera Lent Education Society. He now currently practices in Louisiana, helping patients with specialty contact lenses. Thank you as well for joining us tonight. All right, well, thank you, Roxana, for the kind introduction. And I want to say it's a real pleasure getting to speak tonight, especially with Dr. Davidson, despite the fact that we went to rival schools and, and really should hate each other, but, but I, I don't hold it against him. And, and I think we have a, a great discussion for you tonight. Um, here are our disclosures. So before we get too uh, in depth, we have a couple quick poll questions, if you can put those up, uh, Dr. Hamadi, kind of just to give us an idea of who's on the in the audience. Is that up and going? Okay, here we go. So we kind of just want to know, are you a student, an optometrist, staff, and then kind of just what your basic uh, experience is with fitting lenses. So we'll just give you a, <clears throat> a couple more seconds here to do that. So that's probably enough time there. Let's see what we got. <clears throat> All right, so a few students, a number of optometrists, and then mostly uh, new fitters here. So that's good. So when Dr. Davidson and I were kind of discussing, you know, tonight's presentations, we kind of came up with a theme of, you know, so I graduated, now what? So, you know, for our students, you know, they get a pretty good education these days um, at school, you know, not just with the didactics, but they get... Um, quite a bit of uh, laboratory and, and hands-on uh, experience. Um, I've, I've, I've seen this um, myself. We have externs that come to our practice, and I know Dr. Davidson as well. And then, you know, the Sclerwin Society goes to the schools and works um, with the scleral program. And so they really are coming out quite sharp and, and kind of know how to fit the lenses. Um, <clears throat> so what we kind of wanted to do is, you know, how do we take their knowledge and build a practice? And then there are, of course, the few uh, doctors on here that maybe, you know, learn sclerals while they're in school, but maybe haven't touched them since they left, or maybe they're looking to kind of build their practice up. So hopefully we can kind of talk about what you need to really get started with the practice. So <clears throat> what do you need? You know, at the core of it, you, need, you definitely need to have motivation and the knowledge to fit, although that's something that you can learn over time, and then the patience. And then of course, we'll talk about equipment supplies and office support a little bit later. So why if it's sclerals, you know, there's obviously benefits to the patients with a well-fit lens. They're quite comfortable. They restore visual function for irregular and diseased corneas. They improve quality of life. And of course they can be quite versatile as we'll see in, in one of our next slides. And then they do have a benefit to the practice. If you're in an area, um, especially if you're joining a practice out of school, 
or maybe a new practitioner to a an underserved area, there might be the need to start a practice so you don't have to send your patients away where they have to drive. I know I get some patients that come from a couple hours away. Dr. Davidson, he gets patients from you know four or five hours away. And you know, with these day in these day and ages, time is money, gas is no joke. So, you know, if you can save them time and be, you know, a source. Um, for care, that's obviously great for your practice. And then if you continue to grow that, you can become a referral source yourself where other practitioners in the area can refer to you. And then it can be a pretty good revenue source. Um, you know, square lenses themselves can be lucrative, um, but more so, you know, they'll keep your patients in your practice and there's other revenue streams that can be driven off, um, off of them. But there, of course, are challenges, which is why not everybody fits them. You know, the fitting process is more intensive in terms of both chair time and expertise that's needed. There are some challenges for patients um, in terms of handling, um, application and removal, care and compliance. Costs can be prohibitive for some. And then, of course, you know, we are fitting these lenses on disease and irregular cornea, so we have to pay attention to long-term cornea health. And although they're quite safe, any contact lens carries some risk. So real quick, as Dr. Uh, Hamadi had mentioned in our intros, you know, Dr. Davidson and I kind of come from different backgrounds. You know, I did a contact lens residency and was lucky to join a practice that was already fitting sclerals. So we just kind of had to take that, build upon that foundation and grow it. Whereas he kind of began his own specialty practice and really built it up. So, you know, with our different backgrounds, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Davidson, how did you teach yourself scleral lenses? Did you find that your education in school was sufficient or what did you do to, to supplement and build on to that? Hey, awesome. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rob. Um, first off, again, thanks for letting me be here. I see a couple of familiar faces. Uh, Dr. Crosby, Brian, man, miss you. So glad to see you on here. Um, yeah, how did I build my clinic? Uh, I actually started with zero patients, zero square lens patients. I'm at a really big MDOD practice and it was really self-taught. I had a lot of interest in scleral lenses before, you know, when I was in school. And honestly, I did corporate for a couple of years and I lost a lot of those skills. Um, but all these um, labs have got wonderful resources online. Um, the Scleral Lens Society, fantastic stuff. Uh, Dr. Melissa Barnett, uh, the guide to scleral lens fitting. A lot of wonderful, wonderful resources out there. So if you just take, you know, your time, devote a couple hours a week to watching some webinars, and then just honestly throw a few lenses on patients and, and just call the lab and just say, hey, this is what I'm looking at. Can you kind of help me? It started with one, two patients, maybe a month. And um, now we're getting corneal specialist referrals from multiple states. And um, yeah, today, I think I saw, I think overall, at least 20 scleral lens patients, probably half-ish new fits. So yeah, it can be built. Um, there's definitely a need. So I, I was kind of self-trained, to be honest with you, with the help of the labs. Did you attend any meetings when you were first beginning? Did you find those to be valuable or did you kind of lean on your labs to really to learn? Actually, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I actually did attend, I think it was optometry's meeting um, a few times and sat in on the SLS um, meetings. And um, yeah, that was a great foundation, allowed you to actually throw lenses on the eyes. So yeah, actually, that's why I'm so partial to, to y'all is you gave me a great footing. So gotcha. absolutely. Well, to us, but, but yeah, so, you know, and, and it's also important to note, most of these programs are either fairly inexpensive to, if not free to you. Some of the meetings obviously incur some cost, but um, certainly the online resources, the webinars, the social media, um, a lot of these printed materials are free. So there's definitely plenty of inexpensive options to teach yourself. And I would echo, echo uh, Josh, um, you know, about really discussing with your labs, making their consultants and their teams, you know, your best friend, you know, they definitely want to teach you how to fit their lenses. So you can really lean on them quite early um, on and, and, and go from there. <clears throat> So of course, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety of indications. This is not an exhausted list. You know, we could spend, you know, tons of times talking about tons of time talking about how to fit lenses on these patients. But, you know, where do we find the patients? You know, when you're looking at your practice evaluating the need, 
you know, most of the time, if you're walking into a newer practice to sclerals, you're going to probably have to farm or manufacture those patients from within your office. So, you know, not everybody will start, you know, at an ODMD place where they get easy referrals from cornea specialists that work side by side. So you do have to look at who is in your patient population. You know, no matter where you're at, you'll probably have a couple cones. You know, uh, I know, you know, Josh, you work in an area where RK was huge. Those are really easy cases um, to kind of improve the vision. I wouldn't call them easy. Well, I shouldn't say easy, but they're they're, they're present. And they they definitely, when done well, they really appreciate, you know, the, the improvement in quality of vision. And the stability of vision, and it opens up a lot of opportunity for even advanced designs like multifocals if you, you know, can, you know, get a good fit. So there's plenty of those patients out. You know, your post LASIK patients that maybe don't have the best vision but are hard to fit soft lenses on. They don't have to be ectatic. We'll go back to the okay patients. You yeah. know, that those are one of the most. Uh, I was scared to throw an RK, you know, to throw a scleral yeah. an RK patient, to be mm-hmm. completely honest with you. But, you know, the thing about RK is a lot of those patients were early adapters to technology that knowing what we know now, not great, but, you know, scleral lenses make sense. They kind of think about it. And a lot of them are really excited to give them a shot. So yeah. some of my <clears throat> most happy scleral yeah. lens patients are actually the RK patients. Yeah. I would agree. Oh, um, so, you know, another question that I have for you is what are your thoughts on fitting normal cornea patients to begin with? Do you find them to be good candidates or do you find them to be perhaps a little bit more, uh, have higher expectations? So, you know, your high amotropes, you know, there are some that do quite well, your GP intolerant that really want the optics. Um, but what do you think about you know, you're just your dry eye patients with a little bit of contact lens discomfort and particularly your presbyops now that there are a plethora of multifocal op- optics around. Do you think they're, they're good starting points or would you maybe shy away? No, no, actually um, there's a lot there to answer. So I really am happy putting a scleral lens on anyone that's willing to give it a shot. Um, for example, this last week I had a 16 year old and, you know, he's really not, you know, he's a rather high plus, maybe four plus four and a half, a couple of plus still, but he's a um, really good baseball player. And so I put one of his buddies that was actually a minor cone in scleral lenses. And now the kid is seeing incredible batting average has gone through the roof. They drive a couple hours for me to put a scleral lens in this kid because he wants that vision. So I really don't have a problem um, putting a scleral lens on, you know, a really visually demanding patient. Um, presbyopes, you know, boy, oh boy. Um, that's, that's a loaded question. That depends on the patient. But it is interesting. A lot of these, yeah. I'm getting more and more normal, uh, normal corneas that, you know, their buddy has it, that they're seeing so incredible that they want to try it as well. So... Kind of interesting, but I have no problem with it. What about you? Um, I would agree. You know, I think like with like all presbyopic patients, you just have to really do your due diligence, discuss their motivations, their demands, you know, kind of see what their situation is. You know, crazy enough, sometimes the irregular cornea patients that have been in lenses and, you know, long enough, as long as they don't have, you know, corneal scarring or pacification in their visual axis, they're oftentimes just so grateful to have any little bit of reading that they, they always surprise me and do better than I expect. Um, so even the irregular cornea, scleral lens wearers, as long as they don't have like anything real crazy in terms of like, um, you know, front surface tericity or crazy, you know, um, micro vaults or, or notches or something where stability probably outweighs the optics. Um, I don't have a problem going for it, but I'd also spend a lot of time kind of cautioning them about, you know, the, the expectations and, and what we can and can't do, but I'm, I'm not opposed to fitting any patient in a, in a multifocal even. Um, but I do find that sometimes, you know, the ones that read about them online and show up, you know, looking for a full range of vision, you know, perfect vision everywhere and, you know, super comfortable lenses. Sometimes they are, you know, difficult, but you know, that's, that's to be expected. So, um, uh, good discussion there. So, 
you know, once you build up your internal patients, then you can go seek, you know, external referrals. I don't know if you went out and sought them out. I mean, we, of course, talked to, you know, our local optometrists in the area that, that don't fit sclerals and we have our, our, um, <clears throat> our, our friends in ophthalmology that, you know, refer to us for sclerals. Um, but I didn't necessarily go knocking door to door, you know, with many people, they kind of find their way to you. Um, but I also think, you know, you can also go talk to your uh, subspecialists, you know, your oncologists, your rheumatologists, um, and even primary care, if you're in a small town, you know, just, they always get asked about vision related things, whether it be children's or adults. So it's just good for them to know what you have available. Um, did you go out knocking door to door? I mean, I know a lot of them came from your practice to begin with. I actually did. Um, I get a ton of referrals from corporate ODs um, just because they don't have the, you know, the time um, and the, you know, instrumentation to actually fit these or feel comfortable. I also um, get a lot of referrals from corneal specialists. So in actually, yeah, I did reach out to a lot of the corporate doctors and they've been great. Um, you know, they just really want the best care for their, their patients. And so those are, those are easy. Yeah. So it's, they just almost single-handedly those in the corneal specialists, along with the, the doctors in my practice, pretty much booked me solid from just a couple months out. Gotcha. And then finally, of course, there's marketing, traditional advertising and social media. I, I'm not a big social media person myself, so I'm guilty of not, you know, being an expert there, but I do have some patients that have told me they follow some of our colleagues that are well known in the, the industry and they get a lot of information from, from them. So probably I need to step my game up, but um, just little tidbits of, you know, their day to day, the type of patients they're seeing and, and good, you know, information about scleral lens research, the new technologies and even things, you know, not always scleral lens related, like various eye drops and therapeutics that are also, you know, scleral lens adjacent. So I know you kind of have your own social media presence there. Josh, um, I can let you just talk briefly about that if you wish. You know, um, Williamson, we have a really strong social media and advertising, but honestly, it all goes to LASIK. It all goes to premium cataract surgery as well as normal eye exam. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm on Instagram and, mm -hmm. you know, I was pretty hot and heavy with that for a while, but just like all things, it, it kind of fades. Um, I do have some patients that follow me on it, but very, oops very, very, very few. So gotcha. Um, gotcha. It's more word of mouth. If you do a great job, mm -hmm. and, um, if patients seem to generally like you, you can build this. Right. So moving on, you know, another really common question that, you know, gets asked of, you know, us when we're out, you know, on the boards and the, and the, and the social media uh, groups is, you know, well, what do you need to really get started from an equipment standpoint? And, you know, obviously diagnostic lens sets, they're, they're essentially mandatory. Um, that's probably the only thing that you truly need to fit a lens. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you don't need other things to fit them well, but the only true thing that you need. And so one question that I always see is, well, what lens should I choose? What are people's favorites? And there's so many, you know, uh, labs and designs and they're all great. They all have their benefits. So, you know, my personal recommendation is to, you know, first look at what labs you already work with. Now, I would assume that if you're starting scleral lenses, you probably fit, you know, gas perms, maybe not prolifically, but you should have a gas perm of a lab that you work with, whether it be, uh, you know, just anything, even if it's through a distributor, um, they all have um, designs at their disposal. And I get a little nervous, to be honest, if they've never fit a gas perm, because as you know, when you become a referral center, you know, you'll get patients that come in for sclerals, but maybe they don't need it. All or the maybe time. all the time, or maybe they're not told about the cost, the process. And when you break it down, you know, they're no longer interested, but they do want a gas perm or a hybrid. So you'd hate to have them referred to you for this specialty, but then not be able to fit them in a corneal gas perm if it's appropriate or a hybrid. So if you don't have a lab that you're working with, I, that would be the only time I'd say really take a step back and think about, do you want to go down this road? Because you need to have some degree of experience and, ex and expertise there. But assuming you have a lab that you've already worked with, you know, I think the natural you know, thing is to discuss their scleral design. Although if you're kind of going from scratch and you want to, you know, explore other options, 
then I usually look for versatility. You know, one or two labs at best to begin that have one or two designs within their portfolio that kind of gives you a full range. So a smaller diameter, maybe for normal corneas or smaller HVIDs and apertures, and then a larger design for your more irregular um, corneas. And then something that has the ability to kind of add some more advanced options, you know, whether it be toric haptics and multifocal notches or vaults, um, you know, understanding you know, their front surface toric options and, and just kind of, you know, all of that. And then also understanding, of course, their return and warranty policies that go with it um, because you don't want to get tied up on something um, and find out that maybe it doesn't align with how you, you intend to, to kind of design your, your, your protocol. Can I so skip in here? any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. I completely agree with that. I think that, you know, you know, when you open up your scleral lens cabinet, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to say, Oh, look at all these great fittings. I sets I have from all these different companies, but I would strongly recommend <clears throat> like one, two, maybe three, but usually one or two lenses that you get to know upside down, in and out, you know everything about that lens. I've got two, really three manufacturers that I use you know, quite a bit, a lot, and one of them a lot more than the others. And then of course I've got the, the product like an iPrint Pro, but you know, it, it's something to really have that really strong knowledge in just your favorite lens. Um, that's what I'd recommend. Yeah, I would agree. And once you kind of know, you know, what type of patients you have, and if there are any shortcomings of the design you use, you can supplement later. I mean, I have probably a dozen different sets split between the two offices I'm at. And, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, just grab what's available. Um, but there, you'll find that there are certain lenses that you favor for certain conditions. And, you know, certain labs that you you know, just feel maybe a hair more comfortable with, you know, the intricacies of the design, but they're all great. And they're all, like we said earlier, willing to teach you their design. Um, so the diagnostic sets, the one thing, you know, more and more now we're seeing a lot of empirically designed lenses, you know, freeform designs, you know, molded uh, custom printed lenses, but even those you still require some type of diagnostic lens strictly for power. Um, so even if you jump, you know, from, you know, and you skip, you know, the beginner lenses, so to speak, and go right into the advanced ones, you still need, you know, a diagnostic set. Um, and of course, those other, you know, more advanced lenses do incur more cost in terms of equipment as well. So I would think for the audience here, you're not jumping to those um, complex lenses right away, although certainly, you know, they can be added. And, and, you know, there's something to, you know, I, I wouldn't jump right to the complicated lenses because those also increase your patient cost. And a lot of these patients, I, I very few will I actually put an eye print pro. Most 95%, 90 to 95%, even the corneal specialist referrals I get, I can put them in, you know, an ample eye, a Blanchard one fit met or, or whatever it may be. So um, I, I'd be very hesitant if I was a provider to even consider starting off with those very advanced lenses. Agreed. So topography and tomography, is this needed? Um, you know, real quick, you know, topography, of course, measures the anterior corneal surface, usually through placido disc. There's a lot of things that you can do with your topography, curvature, shape, HVID, pupil diameter, angle kappa, and of course, tear film analysis on many of them. Um, and then tomography is your pentacam, your orb scan, and they tell us a little bit more about the entire cornea, the posterior float, um, and elevation and even pachymetry. So the big question is, do you need one to start? What do you think, Josh? Who you and I had a wonderful discussion <clears throat> about this before we, um, before we began this. And you convinced me that actually, I think you should, because you know it's gonna allow you to, especially if you're monitoring a cone, well, you're gonna actually be able to see if that cone's progressing, especially if they haven't cross-linked. And also you gotta be able to build these things. Right. And a lot, most, most insurances do require this type of imaging. Right. So I would so, say yes. I would say actually yes. So I put yes with an asterisk because 
I don't think when you're starting, you necessarily have to have a unit in your office, but it does need to be available to you, whether the patient gets referred in with it or you have a local you know, office or you know, colleague that would be willing to do them for you. Um, because I do think you don't necessarily need it for the actual fitting of the lens per se, um, because you can just look at the shape, you know, from side view. Um, and, you know, even though some diagnostic sets, you know, encourage you to look at K's and HVID, I don't think, you know, you're not necessarily always looking at the topography or tomography to do so, but it's critical to manage their corneal condition. And in a lot of cases, if you take managed care of any kind, you need to have the supporting documents to get paid. So mm -hmm. I would say, yes, you need it, but it doesn't have to be the f always available to you in your office right away. Although if you intend to become, you know, a sclerosis practice, you definitely need it at some point. One more thing in regards to the topographer. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you know your glucose rep, or even if you just <clears throat> know the company, you can actually get a really great topographer. I think it's for like maybe 8,000-ish, maybe even less mm -hmm. than that until the end of July. It's normally like fifteen or $16,000, but they're just trying to get topographers more in the hands of a general optometrists, primary care. That way they can get more um, cross-linking evaluations. So great. I'll talk Glockos if you need one and you want a really great deal on a, on a really great topographer. All right. So profilometry, profilometry, you know, there's, there's a couple of different um, uh, units or instruments out there. I'm not going to go too into depth. There's tons of lectures out there on, you know, the various, um, you know, archives, the SLS, the, you know, Wu University, GPLI, um, plenty of uh, resources out there about profilometry. And really a lot of the topics we talk about, you can find, you know, supporting uh, lectures and webinars archived in all of those places. Um, but do you need it? You know, for a new fitter, obviously it's a great tool. It does a lot of the work for you. It can make things more efficient, a little less guesswork, but probably just straight up from a cost standpoint, it might be a little prohibitive in early stages um, because there's not always like a direct ROI. I mean, there is ROI usually in terms of time, or if you choose to pay, you know, charge the patient out of pocket, but it's not always um, billable through insurances in some cases. So um, you have to be mindful there, but I would say, obviously, if you can get one, if you have, you know, a blank check for new equipment, you know, definitely, I would, you know, I would encourage you to get one, but it's probably not necessarily realistic for everybody just starting out, um, you know, and, and you can definitely learn to fit lenses quite efficiently without it. Um, you know, when I came out of school, these didn't exist. And so, you know, and toric haptics weren't even a huge thing at the time. So, you know, we learned with everybody, but certainly if you can get one, a great tool to have. Do you have I, one, Josh? I still do not have one. <clears throat> gotcha. Honestly, you know, I average about yeah, one to two remakes mm -hmm. um, right. per patient. So I really, I don't foresee getting one on the horizon. Gotcha. So OCT, another one, um, you know, another tool that many of us will have in our practices already for our primary care and disease um, patients. So, you know, it's not a huge stretch to, to use this. Um, you know, it has um, applications in determining depth, especially in an area that, you know, you may be having trouble visualizing. So those minimal clearance spots, um, you can definitely use it um, to evaluate haptics. You can serial, do serial measurements to, eval to evaluate settling. You know, in certain cases, you can look at, you know, irregularity like scars or bullet, you know, and things like that. And of course, pachymetry, if you're, you know, following, you know, a, a, a cornea that might have endothelial compromise like a graft. So, um, you know, there's a lot of practicalities there in terms of, you know, how you use it for a slit lamp. You know, this may be a little hard to view, but, you know, if you're looking there, it's a very thin beam, you know, and this is centrally, I don't have the, the limbus uh, in, in view here, but this is that patient. And you can see, you know, there might be 90 to hundred centrally, but you're basically landing on the mid peripheral cornea. So if you're unsure what you're seeing, or if, you know, if you come in and they're, you know, wearing, you know, lenses to their follow-up, you know, there's not always fluorescein, even if you put fluorescein over the top, you might not be able to visualize it. So you do need to see, 
that um, in white light, and that can be challenging. So you can definitely utilize your OCT. Now, again, in our discussion previous to this, you know, I, I was telling Josh that I don't use my OCT probably as much as I could simply because of, you know, the time. Um, so in my opinion, I wouldn't say it's 100% mandatory, but also a great tool for the new, new fitter and probably not a huge stretch to purchase, to have because you're probably using another, in other aspects. But what do you think, Josh? So again, you know, just like you're Ohio State, not Michigan, I do uh-huh. <laughs> Again, you know, this is this is great. I I, I hope that the um, the participants really see that there are no two exactly the same scleral lens practices. You can you know really you know skin this cat a lot of different ways, and and it works very well. I actually do have a run. I do edge and central um, on every single patient every single time they come in uh, with their lenses. Um, I don't use them all the time. But I do like having that data. And it's also really good for our, our students too. So um, yeah, I actually <laughs> learn it every single time. I might not look at it every time, but I've yeah. got a couple of technicians that help me out with it and they do a great job. Right. So we did a little asterisk there too. You know, yes, I think you can consider it essential. If you don't have one, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go out and buy it solely for scleral lenses, but probably good to have just for your practice. And if you have it, you certainly should utilize it when you're just starting out simply as kind of a, you know, a a check or something to fall back on um, to evaluate, especially if you're, you know, running behind, you can get that data while the patient's, you know, sitting there and while you're seeing other patients. So anterior seg camera, you know, again, it's a great tool to have. Um, I don't have one in every single lane in our office. So it's not always practical for me to, you know, play musical chairs with my patients. When I do have it available, you know, I will use it. You know, you certainly can use it to monitor the cornea, you know, for long-term health aspects. It's great for consultation to take pictures and send to your consultants, you know, whether it be on their online portal or via email. Telemedicine, you know, there's an option there, depending on your, your thoughts there, you know, now that we're mostly out of COVID, that's not as big of an issue when we were in the throes of it, you know, that was a little more popular. And I think it's also a great tool for patient education. You know, you can show the patient what you're seeing, why it's important. You know, for example, this graft patient with the Neo, you know, show them, you know, well, yeah, you have Neo, you know, we need to watch it. You know, there, there's risks of overwear, the importance of using the right products, the importance of monitoring wear time, and really the importance of just follow-up. Um, so when I when I have it available, I love to take pictures. There are a lot of you know I, iPhone and iPad apps and and adapters. I have one, and I'll admit I'm not great at using it. I don't know what you use, Josh, um, for for photography. I, I've actually got a few anterior segment cameras. And, <laughs> gotcha. You know. I'm sure a lot of the people that are on this, you know, um, webinar mm-hmm. are beginners or they're kind of nervous, like, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm going to mm-hmm. you know, ask the lab a stupid question. I still, to this day, today, actually, mm-hmm. I got on and sent a few videos and pictures to one of my favorite labs and said, listen, I, I really don't know what's going on here. Um, can you, can we kind of talk through this together? <laughs> Yes. You know, if you've got it, it'd be great. Mm. By no means yeah. is it necessary. Yeah. A, a picture is worth, worth a thousand words. So if you can show them a picture versus try and explain it, you know, that really helps them, the consultants out too. So I don't think it's essential, but a very nice tool to have. And then finally, you know, end of, uh, specular microscopy aberrometry, again, for new fitters, probably not going to be something you'll rush out to buy, you know, Specular microscopy is great to have if you're doing a lot of diseased and uh, endothelial uh, compromised corneas, grafts, you know, for serial monitoring, you know, aberrometry, I think is potentially, you know, part of the future of scleral lenses, but not everybody's going to have that. I don't have either of these in my practice, but I can send them out um, to get them when I need them. I'm not doing a lot of uh, higher order aberration sclerals at the moment. Um, but that's simply because I don't have easy access to an aberrometer, but I know there's a lot of people, you know, in our field doing lots of studies that are published. I, I'm sure if anybody's going to ICSC, there'll be some more data and research there, um, but pay attention to that as, as things progress. Even so, if, even if oh, you get an aberrometer like I do, mm-hmm. you can get one, 
Yeah. I, I've used it maybe five times. Yeah. So. so that's kind of the first half of the presentation. I guess real quick before we shift over to, to Josh primarily, is there any questions? I saw in the chat, somebody wanted to know if there's going to be notes. Um, all the webinars get archived, so they'll be available afterwards um, on our website um, and on our YouTube page. And all you have to do is be a member, which is free, and then you can log in and it'll all be there for, for consumption later. Um, and I think that was the main question. Mm -hmm. So do you have control over the screens, Josh? Let me request it. Okay. So I'll turn it over to you from the, the remainder of the lecture here. I think I got it. I got it. All right. So, you know, we talk about all the things that, you know, you might need, you might not need, and, you know, compelling arguments on both ends. But really what you do need is a really good staff because, you know, scleral lenses, they really can take a while. Um, I actually, part of this presentation was built, um, you know, about a year or so ago, and it's still really... Um, you know, it's still very much um, accurate. And I actually built my scleral uh, um, presentation, my whole scleral um, office with the help of Miss Robin, who was um, actually a technician. So Miss Robin was my right-hand woman. She was my everything. She did everything with me. If you want to read a little bit more about Robin, how I found her, how I recruited her, how I trained her, um, if you go back to that March 2020 issue of Contact Lens Spectrum, you can actually read about it. I know there was a lot of other things going on in March of 2020. You may have missed it. Um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good information in there from both her and I. And this isn't wanting to advance. There we go. Oh, I think we're both trying to do this. Let me handle it. Oh, I was just trying to answer the Q&A, but I guess whenever I click on my screen, it it goes. So I'll let, I'll, I'll just leave the. Okay, there we go. I got it. Don't touch it. Don't touch okay. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, but I actually did lose Robin. Robin actually moved away about an hour, hour and a half away. And she drove for a little while and then realized that the roads of Southern Louisiana just are not a good place to drive every single day for hours on end. So I've actually in the process of kind of recruiting and training my new Robin. So how do I train my staff? Because again, I am not the most organized person. This is actually the most organized part of my house um, by far. So uh, I've got my staff that pretty much does everything for me as far as the organization, um, you know, scheduling patients and all that good stuff. But I train them all on what a scleral lens is, what I look for, all that. Um, the Scleral Lens Society has been, you know, by far, my, my biggest uh, resource. There's also a lot of great videos on YouTube. I'll actually sit there and create a little playlist for my staff for new hires. And they'll sit there and they'll watch all these videos at least once, usually twice. Again, Scleral Lens um, Education Society, they've got a whole playlist of videos that I often have my um, staff sit there and watch. Great, great, great information. Because a lot of the times your staff is going to be the one that answers the phone calls about these things um, and does that initial troubleshooting. So having them have a really good foundation of what a scleral lens is, is hugely, hugely important. Even if you only see a few of these a week or a month, hugely important. Uh, we talked about the lab resources. That's what I used a lot of my train uh, training with. Um, there's a lot of great fitting guides. Blanchard has a great one. Um, Art's got some good stuff, Zen Lens as well. And you also have to think outside the box um, when training your staff. So the Dry Eye Shop um, has got wonderful resources. I believe her name is Rebecca. It's a family owned company. And she's got some great information, kind of scleral lens 101. So it's the same resources that patients get, you know, your staff can get. Of course, the GPLI and, and all the great books that are out there that you can easily uh, request or just purchase on your own. Um, this is kind of, uh, I guess my, my old schedule before I, I lost Robin, 
But you can see, I actually had a whole schedule where Robin handled most of my follow-ups. You know, she'd bring them back. I'm going to go over how I had her doing all that, how I'm able to incorporate my staff to see this, you know, very large volume of sclera lenses. But when I started off, you know, when you're just kind of getting into this, um, you know, where do you put these patients? Do you put them in the middle of the day? Do you schedule them for uh, just a normal contact lens fit? How do you go about doing this? And I actually would actually end up putting lens um, patients either right before lunch or first thing in the morning, first thing um, at, you know, first patient at, at lunch or, you know, one of the last patients of the day. I would hardly ever put them in the middle of the day, okay? So again, you know, if you're just starting off, I would create just, you know, one scleral lens um, appointment on, on your rubric, maybe first thing in the morning or last thing um, before lunch, you know, when you know that you've got that extra time to spend with them and to do all that good stuff. And you just kind of build up and build up from there. So when I started off again, I had zero patients and, and now we have to have our own crazy schedule just for it. And I started off by just putting those patients in one specific slot just a couple times a week. Um, we talk about, you know, what you need in the office. And again, a lot of this uh, is very easily accessible. You know, the office supplies, you know, your labs will send the, um, some mirrors and the starter kits, all the cases. DMVs, you can buy on um, dryeyerescue.com, shop dry eye, Amazon's got them. You know, you need some blue lights or they say you need blue lights. I really hardly ever use an actual blue pen light. I'll just put them behind this little lamp. Um, and this again, the Scleral Lens Education Society has got a lot of great information for what you can hand to a patient, which we're going to get into here in just a few moments. Josh, so, real quick, that, that form is actually on our website. Yes. Um, and it has a couple, of, there's the second page to it that has like a checklist where you can you kind of write out the instructions for what you specifically want them to use so you don't have to like circle that. Um, and that's again, free to access. And this is part of buy packet that we hand out to patients is this exact uh, information sheet. Um, so. Yeah, and this is actually an updated one. I have, the, I've got the older one, so I've got to yes. get on that. Yes, some new products out there. Um, and so we're always trying to update that. Gotcha, all right. Um, so, you know, the big thing is, you know, let's say you want to do this, you know, you're going to bring, you're going to bring a scleral lens, um, program into your clinic. You know, how do you do that then? So one of the most common questions I get, you know, DM'd on, on Instagram or online or wherever is, you know, what are your different visits look like? And uh, my, my answer is always, well, you know, it depends. If it's an internal referral and I have all this information about the patient, you know, oftentimes we'll just go ahead and file insurance and all that good stuff. But for the most part, if a patient's coming to me for a scleral lens, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give them a good exam, a full exam. I'm going to run, uh, we've got a Pentacam, so we're going to run the, the Pentacam. I'm going to give them a really good corneal evaluation, also look at the back, all that good stuff, see what's going on with that retina. You know, we're going to refract. You've got to refract if you're going to try to get this paid for by insurance. And we're going to talk about insurance, um, you know, whether we think this is going to get paid for or if it's not going to get paid for, kind of give the patient some expectations there. And I'm going to give them a, a quick little folder. Uh, Rob, you, you mentioned, um, you know, you have a packet of information for your patients. What's in your packet? Um, we have basically a little information about scleral lenses, what medical necessity is, the types of, you know, managed care, whether it be vision or medical, an ABN of sorts, our warranty and return policy. Um, and then, of course, you know, once we fit them, they get like the, the, the uh, application removal information. We have them watch the video at home or in the office and we give them, you know, a starter kit as well. Um, so it's very similar to what it looks like yours is. We try to just be as forthcoming as possible, you know, with our policies, our procedures, and just in general, when we have them in for their first visit, you know, what to expect, because, you know, it is a process, you know, it's not a one and done visit, you know, you're seeing them for several months, a couple months, typically, um, from beginning to end. And then of course, hopefully lifelong, um, if they, if you do a good job, and they remain loyal and don't move. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's that's very similar to what what's in mine. Um, I think that you know you giving something for your patients to walk out of there with is so hugely important. You know, it, it motivates them. It lets them know, hey, this is these people know what they're doing. I mean, look at this look at this handout thing I got. Um, in mine, pretty much the same thing. Um, I do have a, a couple pretty large documents in there that also explain what I call the fine print. And I just sat there and for probably about a year, I wrote down all like the good questions I got from patients, wrote them down, came up with good answers and put them all in a document. <clears throat> so that way I'm not getting a call at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday night saying, Hey, you know, what about this? So, um, I, I really recommend you, you have a folder out there for, for a patient. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I will get a new patient that's been, you know, fit elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And the fit's not bad. It's really not that bad. But the folder alone really just kind of screams yeah. legitimacy. And it's been a great way to build a clinic. Yeah. So you give your personal information out, like an email or cell phone, or do you refrain? Uh, I used to give out Robin's information. Ah. So I, I actually, I, I don't. I yeah. don't. I've uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did have to meet up with a patient in a CVS parking lot at like nine o'clock at night, super sketchy <laughs> to take her lens out. Cause I didn't feel yeah. we're both living in the same area. Gotcha. So very rare. Will, will someone get my information? Gotcha. I, a lot of times will give my email, my work email address. Um, cause I figure that's a little easier to contact me that way via than trying to get through our automated phone tree. So, but I don't ever give my cell phone out. Or very, very rarely, unless it's like a somebody I know quite well. Yeah, I've done it and it was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in between that first uh, visit and, and a second visit, you know, what, what's happening? Uh, really, our technicians and our billing departments are going to work. Um, you know, we've, I've had our billing and coding team watch all the wonderful webinars. Again, shout out to the um, Square Lens Education Society, GPLI, Woo You. A lot of great um, webinars out there about billing and coding. So, you know, they go to work, they figure it all out. Is it going to be covered? Is it not going to be covered? Um, and they talk to the patient and they kind of go over all this stuff. And then they try to get the patient to pay for it over the phone. Usually they do. In rare extenuating circumstances, the patient will actually pay for the fit the day of. So like before they get brought back. Um, but for the most part, they're scheduled before, uh, right after they pay. And then they come back for that second visit. Patient comes back. Um, and that's where we do the fitting. So I do the fitting almost always on the second visit. That way everyone knows expectations. The patients already knows that, you know, the, they're not going to be walking out of there with the lens. In fact, I tell them we average one to two remakes. So it might even be two more visits before they, they get their lens. And, and they know all that. Um, my, my uh, technicians are trained so well that they know I like to fit this type of lens for this type of cornea, this type of diagnosis, this type of diagnosis. They're going to have a different fitting set in there for me. Um, before Robin left, she actually knew me so well and she was so good. She would actually have her lens, the lenses out that she thought that I would need, the actual specific trials. I'll come in, throw the uh, lenses on, wait a few minutes, staff will come in and, and kind of go to work. So they'll, they'll run the images, they'll, they'll run anterior segment OCT, check that central clearance, do the edges. Um, I've got some technicians that are great refractionists, some that are not. Um, if it's one of the good ones, they know that they can actually, you know, not only get the auto, they all get the auto, but if they're pretty good and they feel comfortable, um, then they'll actually refract too. This is a great way to train your text to kind of refract to because, you know, most basic scleral lens patients, there's not a ton of sill in there, or at least there's usually not a ton of sill. So they'll do that. I walk in and, you know, I'm going to look at, uh, we've got a pentacam image um, occasionally of the whole scleral lens fit. I'll look at the central clearance, the edges, and um, I'll usually double check the refraction. Just make sure everything sounds good. And um, technician will have a fluorescein strip, wet it, wipe it on the front of the eye, see what's going on with that tear film exchange. And the whole time, you know, while we're doing all that, I'm calling it all out verbally to my scribe or the technician. 
And um, basically what happens then is they type it all down or type it all up and um, they print it up and then it goes on a whiteboard. I've got, again, I'm not the most organized person. I joke that's the most organized part of my house. I'm not kidding. It really is. Um, and so this is kind of our setup. You know, when new lenses come in, they go in a manila envelope, they call the patient, schedule a follow-up. Um, and then all the lenses that need to be ordered are stuck to a whiteboard. Uh, Rob, how, how do you make sure you don't forget to order lenses? Good question. And I'll admit on occasion, one will slip through the cracks and I'll forget. Um, but usually, you know, I, I will message myself, you know, to get the insurance processed. And then I get a note, I'm, I'm supposed to get a notification when the insurance has gone through. And then from there I order, and then we will set, we'll kind of create a file for them. And we have a storage area for our specialty lenses and our contact lenses. Um, and that's usually what we do. I'm also not the most organized person. Um, and I will also mention there, there was a great webinar a couple months ago from uh, Elise Kramer and Katie Morrison about their organization techniques. So if you're gonna take any advice, watch that webinar and see what they do because they're, they're probably more efficient than, than you and I. Without um, a doubt. Yeah. So, so that, that's actually, I'm going on vacation next week and mm -hmm. that's my staff's homework is to <clears> see <throat> how Elise does it. And then just kind of like try to copy that because yeah. she's way more organized than me. Um, and again, you know, uh, the last visit is that dispensing appointment and, and various follow-ups, pretty much the same thing. A lot of my technicians are trained to actually be able to put the lenses on, which is wonderful. That saves you an incredible amount of time. So if you can train your te uh, technicians how to put these lenses on, oh my goodness, do it. Yeah. And pretty much the same thing, you know, then let, let the lenses settle, run through the imaging, check the auto, all that good stuff. Yeah. So I, I really think that, you know, the whole point of my little section here is you can build this, you know, I'm not going to say easily, but if you really can find someone that you trust, one of your technicians, your scribes, um, it's easy for them to buy in because, you know, every day you've got patients walking out of clinic with tears in their eyes saying, I, I haven't seen the blades of grass in years. I haven't seen leaves on trees. Um, I had an 11 year old boy with uh, Reese Bucklers um, today, got his first lenses. And he's just like, oh my goodness, my his little brain almost exploded with how clear things were. And, and your staff loves that. That's why they do what they do. That's why we do what we do. We make a difference. And um, it's very, very easy if you've got a compassionate, wonderful technician for them to see what a wonderful opportunity this is to help patients. Um, you know, with that being said, uh, I'm gonna shoot it back to, to Rob. I don't know a ton about billing and coding yeah. and I'm not gonna pretend to. Gotcha. I, I would also mention with your staff, making sure they're also trained to do your application removal training and then communication's a key there too. You know, when you do your exams, you tend to do them in two different visits, a preliminary visit and a, uh, and then a fitting. So making sure when people get scheduled that they know for a fact, that they're most likely not going to get a fitted lens that day. Um, and that it's going to be, you know, multiple visit process is key because sometimes they don't know, you know, what the process is. And a lot of times they come in thinking they're going to leave that day with a lens or even be fit. But, you know, there can be insurance issues here and we don't really have a lot of time. And I, I, these were kind of in here from kind of a, uh, um, a mashup of other lectures. I'm certainly not a billing and coding expert either, but the only thing that I'd kind of make a note of is when you are starting out, you just really need to read all of your policies um, because they're all very different. Medical vision plans, they all cover different things for different criteria. They pay differently. And if you take you know, managed care, uh, whether it's med medical or vision, they're, they're just so different. And, you know, what you think will happen, you know, with one plan doesn't happen with another. Um, and it can also change from year to year. You know, there's always, you know, changes in forms, changes in coverage, and they really just like to, to, to kind of mess with you. And I always tell patients, you know, the insurance companies aren't your friends. They're trying to make money off of you. So you just have to really know what you're getting into and have that, you know, be comfortable with it. If you're going to go down the road of, you know, taking, taking insurance plans. So that, I think that 
just, and again, there's plenty of uh, webinars and resources for billing and coding. So that I think, unless you have any other questions that wraps up for today. And I think um, here's our webinar for next month um, with Dr. Iden, um, a great lecture about HOAs, which we mentioned earlier. I'll be tuning in. Were there any questions on there, Josh, that you saw? Uh, you know, uh, the big questions, it's actually popped up from a different, couple different folks was, you know, boy, you know, I want to start. Um, what's kind of the easiest cases, uh, safest cases to start off with, <clears throat> you know, your first, you know, scleral lens patient. And to a few of the folks that asked that, I, I said, I believe just a mild cone, a mild keratoconic mm -hmm. patient would be, in, in my opinion, the easiest. Uh, what would you think? The only thing about some mild cones is if they're like a mild nipple cone and it's dead center, you'll get a little bit of aberration off that and some ghosting. And so you also have to look at their pentacam and see. So I like actually the moderate cone because they're going to really get that wow. Because some mild cones, they might have 20, 30, 20, 40 vision and they're used to it and it doesn't bother them. Um, and so you're kind of, you know, you have to really stress quality of vision, you know, versus, you know, actual acuity. So I kind of like the moderate to advanced cones, as long as they're just not like crazy, you know, super, super steep where you have to break out, you know, the 18, 19 millimeter lens. I think RK patients are great, especially the ones that have become high hypers um, with, you know, quite oblate corneas. Um, the GP intolerant patients, if you're looking for normal cornea patients, um, you know, they really appreciate that clear, the, the same clarity they're accustomed to with, you know, uh, potentially better comfort um, because they just don't like to go to soft lenses. You know, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt real quick while I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that I see, because we've got a lot of great practitioners in, in our area that mm -hmm. do fit, you know, a few square lenses. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes that I actually see, mm -hmm. it's something you'd really think about uh, uh, often is, you know, these patients that maybe post RK they're yeah. high pluses, or maybe they, they've got scleral lenses because they're just, you know, crazy prescriptions. Mm -hmm. A lot of the doctors that don't fit a lot of lenses, forget about the materials. Yes. Well, if you got a thick lens, you know, you got a plus 10 plus 12, you should really think about getting a, a little bit more oxygen permeable material. Mm -hmm. By the time they get to me, you know, the cornea is just endemic <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. So don't forget about quality materials. Yes. There are ways though, to like manipulate your, your curvatures to adjust your power, which is a higher level kind of topic. But sometimes, you know, if you have a high myope, you know, that you're, you know, get a lot of minification, you can make your lens more oblate to reduce power. If you have a high plus, you might be able to get a little more sagittal depth in there to reduce the, the plus power. So there are ways that you can tweak there. I guess if, if there's only, if as a new practitioner, if I was to go on the other side of the spectrum on ones to be leery of, I would be leery of your graft patients, although they need it. You just have to make sure you're very careful, you know, understanding the age of the graft, making sure they're, you know, getting, you know, um, you're, you're, you're cooperating with your cornea specialists, working hand in hand with them, you know, drilling in the fact that they need constant, you know, checks on their cornea, you know, they obviously they might be taking a steroid or glaucoma medication. So making sure they're compliant with care. Those are the ones that even now, sometimes I worry about the most because you can have a perfect fit and a great looking graph that can go South, you know, despite everything looking, looking great. So, um, yeah. Any other last questions before we wrap yeah. this up? We have a couple. We had one just, just come in. Thank you guys, by the way, for this awesome presentation. Yeah. I'm like taking notes while you're going through it. Um, somebody asked about backup pair of glasses. So obviously a lot of patients that are in scleral lenses, it's because they can't really, you know, see or function well with traditional glasses, but do you still recommend having a pair of glasses like backup um, emergency use ones? And then how do you go about prescribing that? Yeah. Always if they can you know, but sometimes it's difficult. And like you're with your cones, you know, you get those asymmetric spec RXs, you know, so sometimes you have to focus on maybe one eye more than the other. And, you know, that's an art in and of itself, you know, how to prescribe for keratoconics, you know, sometimes we have to sacrifice, you know, qual uh, 
you know, acuity for, for just comfort, you know, there's somewhere, you know, they might correct to 2040, but if there's, you know, six doctors in an ISO and tons of sill, you know, they're not going to be able to wear that comfortably. So you might have to, you know, sacrifice, you know, one eye for the greater good. Um, or maybe leave the sill out, you know, it's kind of against our natural instincts to, you know, reduce prescriptions, but, you know, sometimes you can just do a myopic or hyperopic prescription just to give them something because anything you can give them is better than, you know, 18 hours a day with a scleral. Um, So I always try to do it if I can, but sometimes it's just not feasible. Yeah, I I completely agree. I almost, I always recommend a backup pair of glasses. (laughs) But again, you know, optometry is an art and a science, and, and it's one of those things that really you've got to, you know, talk to the patients, see how visually demanding they are. But man, any kind of <laughs> RX in glasses is a whole lot better than nothing, usually. So, right. yeah, it's, I was recommend it. Awesome. And then I think you guys already answered this in your lecture, but just so we can go over it again, um, Somebody asked, how do you select which lab you're going to work with? Um, I think you look at, see, are you already working with labs? You know, I know there's some international people and, you know, I'm not as familiar with what the international labs are, um, but more and more we're getting more international meetings. So trying to communicate with whoever currently manufactures or distributes their gas permeable lenses, they will most oftentimes have a scleral lens design that they either manufacture themselves or distribute. So I would reach out to labs that you already have some relationship with and see what they have. And if you don't, um, then, you know, just doing your research. I mean, here in the U.S., there's tons of, you know, labs available and they all make great lenses. So coming to a meeting, perusing the exhibit hall, you know, seeing, you know, what type of e-blasts come out, um, social media, and just see kind of who's doing what. There's a lot of different webinars that are very design specific that you can, you know, attend um, either virtually or in person. Um, So, you know, just picking the ones that you're comfortable with because you'll be learning it with them. So you want to have somebody that you're comfortable having those consultation type discussions via phone, email, however you communicate. Yeah. That was beautiful. I have nothing to add. That was, that was Uh, And this question I get from patients all the time when they're first taking their lens home is how many hours can a patient use a clear lens? I know that's a trick. It's always a tough one. To I think it really depends on their condition. I mean, a cone that maybe has contact lens experience, you know, unless I'm a little more hands off and maybe I'll let them go, you know, eight hours right off the, 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 the bat. Um, but obviously a graft will ease into it and we'll set, you know, close follow-up within, you know, seven to 10 to 14 days you know, some of it depends, you know, do they live, you know, 10 minutes from me or three hours from me? Um, and so it depends on their condition, their needs, their, their situation. Um, but I don't have any strict rules, but obviously, you know, if you're worried more about corneal compromise, you know, less time to start. I'm, I'm very much in agreement. You know, it depends on the cornea, depends on the situation, but I start them all off the same way. Two hours the first day, then add an hour every single day. Tell me when you get resistance and then we'll, we'll see where you go from there. So I would say most of my patients can get 12 hours ish, yeah. some more, some less. Yeah. And I'd say about 10% ish have to take <clears throat> things out, you know, clean them out, you know, rub this, you know, put some fresh saline and, and yeah. pop them back in. I also think it depends on how good they are at INR. So even though I don't necessarily do all the INR trainings myself, or um, I'll kind of get a report back from my assistant, or on occasion I'll even do it myself if I'm not busy because I still kind of sickly enjoy it. Um, but um, but you know you can kind of tell. I mean if they're if they do it easily, then you know I also think they're probably going to have less problems versus somebody that's really jabbing and poking their eye. Then I'll start you know less aggressive. You know I might say I just do it two hours a day because you've already just beat your eye eye up putting it in. Um, so that also is something. And then, you know, watching them remove it later too, you know, how much do they struggle and fight if, if it takes them, you know, 20 minutes to take it out, you know, then I'll try to limit their wear time initially as well. I, and I cannot tell you, you know, one of the, the best pearls I would, I would give patient or to, to docs on this, just put a drop of saline on the contact <laughs> before you try to take it out. Mm-hmm. You'd be amazed at how much easier that lens comes out. Just 
drop a saline, boom, boom, take the remover plunger, pop, pop. It is so much easier for you and the patient. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for all those little tips and tricks. 